what I'm going to show you here uh, is uh, how this project came to be and how it is highly relevant, at least we think so, to uh, reconstruction of past and also present land use uh, in uh, dry lands. So we move quite a lot, we switch uh, type of environment from the previous talk uh, and I'm going to talk um, a bit globally about dry lands, although the presentation will be mainly focused on one of the case study of the project, which is uh, in Africa. So I'll switch to the more local uh, later. So why are dry lands important? Well, as you can see from the map on the screen, uh, dry land cover over 40% of Earth's surface and are home to about 2.3 billion people. And with the car current climate change trends, uh, they are bound to increase in surface at least, uh, which uh, proves like a very uh, demanding task in terms of uh, feeding the population who is living in, uh, um, in these areas. And uh, uh, when you think about dry lands, I bet that agriculture is not the first thing that comes to your mind. And that's because most part of dry lands uh, is below the 400 millimeter of rain per year, which is considered the limit for viable uh, agriculture. So when we think about dry land and agriculture, we normally associate that with uh, a source of water, a, an extra source of water ra uh, rather than just the rain. And normally we think of the crew agriculture or floodplain agriculture, and that's the cultivation that's done on the bank of major or minor uh, water courses. Let's think about the Nile, for example, which we'll see uh, later in the example, where people uh, exploit the rich organic fertile soil that lies along the boundaries of the river to cultivate. Other types of agriculture that are carried on are obviously irrigated agriculture, which can be done through the use of, uh, you know, exploiting the water table, so wells, or through the use of water harvesting methods that can be cisterns or they can be even more ephemeral um, ways like uh, little low bound um, stone walls that help contain the water that falls with the rain. Uh, and then there is rain-fed agriculture, which is kind of uh, which is practiced quite widely in uh, regions that have a bit more of rainfall. But with our great surprise uh, from fieldwork, it's practiced very intensively in uh, mm, hyper-arid areas far from any water sources, so far from, uh, um, from rivers and far from wells. And this type of agriculture is done exclusively using the rainfall in places where rainfall is an average of 100, 120 millimeters per year, so well below the considered limit for viable agriculture. So um, we know very little of this type of cultivation and this practice in the present, and we know even less of that in the past. And obviously, uh, if we avoid thinking about that and we don't put it on our maps of present and past land use reconstruction, we are again creating a bias, as Marco and many others were talking about, uh, of land use reconstructions. Um, this is a map that most of you well known from Wittgen, which is the reconstruction of land use in Africa in uh, about 1800 AD. Um, I'm going to focus on basically this area, okay, which is Central Sudan, and which is here considered just pastoralism, which obviously is a very important uh, land use strategy in this area, but it's not the only one. And, you know, you might think, okay, we know a little about the past, but today we must know very well what's going on. Well, this is a... a map that shows the spatial data agreement amongst uh, nine different data sets on land cover but related especially to crops and uh, um, the red colors means no agreement the, the green color means good agreement and the white means no crop at all so as you can see again for the area in which i'm gonna uh, concentrate for this talk which is about here 
there is some agreement, but not very you know, high agreement on what's going on along the Nile. And the rest is just blank, no crops at all. Actually, when you go and look a little bit more at uh, um, the ethnographic record for this practice in, uh, in uh, arid and hyper-arid areas, you find quite a lot of uh, uh, quite a lot of data on it, and as you can see from this map, which is actually a product of Stefano's research, um, this practice is not that uncommon, even in the Sahara, which is the most arid probably part of the world that we can think about. And uh, in here, travelers have recorded uh, uh, the cultivation uh, with just exclusively rainfall of wheat. Of uh, well, they call it wheat. Okay, from the photographs, it's really difficult to see whether it's wheat. I mean, it looks more like sorghum or some sort of millet, which makes more sense. But they, they call it wheat, and they've uh, uh, they've recorded cultivation of palms for dates in all this area. So it's kind of you know a, a practice that's not that restricted. It's quite widespread. So. The project, uh, which started in January, is actually going to try and figure out a little bit what can we say about this practice in the present and in the past. And obviously, as you might imagine, um, this is quite an ephemeral practice. It doesn't leave much traces on the ground. So how can we reconstruct whether it was carried on in the past or not? Well, the idea is, let's go and look at the archaeobotanical remains of the archaeological sites that are located in this area and try to figure out directly from the archaeobotanical remain whether these crops were cultivated using irrigation or were just getting just the rainfall, uh, uh, water just from the rainfall. And here is like a case study that it's part of the project but it's also the idea behind the project because this is where it all started and so we're looking at central sudan the area of khartoum or well uh, omdurman and in here there's a the, the archaeological site of al kidai i'm sorry probably the points are really small uh, this site has been excavated uh, for quite a few years uh, from donatella usai from the uh, sudanese institute uh, archaeological institute of italy and she's got a very good record uh, on uh, what, uh, what was going on in terms of subsistence practices. And it's a site that spans quite a long time from the so-called Mesolithic to Meroitic period. So it will give us quite a nice view of long-term practices at the site. And as you can see, nowadays it's located just outside the boundary of the flooding area of the Nile. And uh, what actually... Um, you know, prompted the, the thinking of or the idea for this project is that when we were doing, uh, um, th the main idea is that there are almost no site in the interior and especially no, uh, no Neolithic period site in the interior and um, because obviously the conditions are very harsh. So when we were doing survey for actually something completely different, we came across the fields that I was showing in the first slide uh, in this area, which is about 15 to 20 kilometers uh, inland, uh, well, in, uh, inland from the Nile River. And here you can see more or less how the landscape changes with the, you know, uh, changing of, well, with, with the getting farther and farther from the Nile. So along the Nile, you have this nice brown, rich soils where they actually, cult where today they cultivate sorghum. And then as you move out, so just outside the boundary of, of the flooding plain, you get a cultivation of panicum, which is uh, uh, more adapted to arid land. And then when you move even further inland, you get these fields uh, again of panicum. And I know it's kind of difficult to see from, from this, uh, this picture, but this is a field, obviously, with the rest of the plant that just been harvested. And all the area where you see a bit reddish, these are all fields. So these are huge field system. It's not a, a little field for subsistence practices. Actually, uh, talking with uh, uh, local farmers, 
they talk about uh, uh, owning fields of uh, several hectares and actually being able to produce double of what they need for, for their subsistence in good years, so in years with uh, 100 millimeter of rain and being able to sell the other half. And actually, this is something you can see very clearly also just from Google Earth. This is the same point. 2011, almost no rain, nothing. 2012, 30, 130 millimeters, and you see the rows of uh, fields uh, uh, appearing. So it's actually a good tool to just pinpoint area where to go and look at. As I said, we talked about, uh, so we, we needed to understand how to uh, investigate this archeologically. So we talked about people and they pointed us to two different field systems. Uh, one they said oh, we've used it a lot but it's not that good and the other one said you know we've, we, we keep using it because it's very good and here are the two field system the one that it's not that good it's actually a huge field that was cultivated for about 10 years and then abandoned but heavily cultivated with plowing mechanical plowing etc because it's near a well although they say they didn't use the well to irrigate the field uh, and the other one is something that we will never consider a good field. It's in the middle of the desert, there's no vegetation around, very arid. So we started to understand how to link this with the archaeology. And what we came up is, uh, uh, with the project is uh, to look at various proxies, amongst which phytoliths, which are biogenica, silic uh, biogenica uh, silica, which is uh, uh, inorganic, so it preserves very well. And there are a few studies that have linked the formation of phytoliths uh, to the quantity of water that the plants received in the past. So we thought we'll go uh, in this way. Uh, another type of study that has, been, um, that has been done on plants in arid uh, areas is how the morphology of the plant changes with more or less water. And for example, this study, which is the only one I could find on the C4 plants, which are the plants that are present in this area, shows how uh, with more water, the plants tend to produce less hair, which is actually one of the easiest phytoliths to find. So I looked at the two fields that I, that I, showed, uh, that I showed before. These one are the bed field that actually, you know, in theory had more water. And these ones are the field, the, the, the good field that for us was not, uh, was not suitable at all. And actually phytoliths confirm that against what you can see on the ground, where, where, you, where you would assume on the ground, the, the site in the desert actually retains more, more moisture, okay? So what phytoliths are, say, are telling us, you know, these samples have less hair. So, you know, the plants that were growing there had less hair. And so this is actually a site that retains more moisture, which actually uh, speaks of the importance of talking to people and the importance of traditional ecological knowledge to understand this type of practices. And, you know, I'm just at the conclusion. The first one is obviously that there's a lot of work to do. These are very, very, very preliminary uh, results uh, and uh, the project has just started. So I'm hope, I hope I'll be able to give you more uh, detail in the next future, uh, but also that this approach, combining different proxies and uh, especially concentrating on <coughs> traditional ec ecological knowledge uh, is very promising for this type of study. And definitely archaeology, archaeological science, archaeobotany can inform on past land use and be integrated in climate modeling. Thank you.